Good evening and welcome to Preparation Day. This is your weekly preparation for the upcoming Sunday. This weekend we'll be looking at Trinity Sunday, so let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Holy Trinity, who inspire our hearts with the fullness of your love, we ask you that you would bring to us all of the things you desire, help us to grow close to you, transform our hearts so that we may receive the fullness of the gift that you have given to us. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So let's begin by looking at the, the weekly update. And uh, the first piece in the weekly update is actually a little bit from Miss Haley Lemoyne, who is our coordinator for youth formation. And it's some good news and it's some, uh, it, it's some bad news uh, all for the, all of us at the same time. Attached to the weekly update this week, you should have seen a letter from Miss Haley. I'm going to go ahead and read all of that right now. Um, instead of the little snippet that I have in the update. Friendly, uh, friends and family of Christ the Redeemer, it is with a heavy yet hopeful heart that I share with you my resignation as the coordinator of youth formation here at the parish. Over the last eight months, I have been welcomed, loved abundantly, encouraged to grow, and entrusted with your children and grandchildren. In return, you gain not only my service, but my gratitude and heart as well. I could not have asked for a more loving parish to serve and a more welcoming parish to integrate my family into. Thank you very much for all that you have done for me and more. Due to personal family reasons, I will be returning home next month. The Lord has called me out of full-time work for the time being as we raise our baby and grow our family. Because the staff have become not only teammates, but role models, mentors, and friends that I look up to, it was an incredibly hard decision to discern. However, I am hopeful that the Lord will continue to bless the next coordinator of youth formation, as well as my little family, as a result of this small yes to his will. With that, I plan to stay at Christ the Redeemer as a parishioner and member of our incredible family. I hope that my family and I will continue to be welcomed as such. I am so grateful for all of you and cannot express the blessings that all of you have been to me and my family. Love and prayers, your sister in Christ, Haley Lemoyne. Now, Miss Haley shared with me a few weeks back that she was intending, uh, that she was contemplating whether or not um, it was right for her to continue um, to devote herself to the ministry here at Christ the Redeemer. And and uh, she let us know that, that, that her decision was that it was not the right thing to do. But... It's important to hear that, Haley, we really thank you for the time that you've given us. Even though, it, even if it feels like it was far too short, we really thank you. I really thank you for this time that you've given us. And if I could ask you, brothers and sisters that, that are listening to this and those of you who are reading the update, um, if you could, the next time you see Haley, tell her thank you and wish her the best and offer her your prayers. That's the best way that we can say thank you and goodbye at the same time to her um, in a way that references um, that, that uh, reverences her, um, but also makes clear that, that we love her very deeply and we still desire her to be part of our family. For some of you, that's going to be a, a, a big deal um, because you're heavily involved with youth formation, either because you have a child in youth formation, you yourself are in youth formation, or you help with youth formation. Um, for now, let's just say thank you to Haley, and we'll we'll look at what the future looks like um, uh, next week. Uh, coming up this weekend, we also have an ordination. I we have uh, two or, we have three ordinations actually. The ordination of two guys to the uh, transitional diaconate that are James Rome and Stephen Castile. We are also going to have the priesthood ordination of, Father, of Friar Nathaniel. You probably, you may or may not have met him. He is a member of the community of the Little Brothers and Sisters of Jesus and Mary. They um, have taken up residence, the, the brothers, the friars have taken up residence uh, south of Homa. The Little Brothers and Sisters of Jesus and Mary do ministry out of Holy Family in Dulac. Um, and uh, Friar Nathaniel is a native of France but uh, is joined the community here in the United States um, and will be doing ministry here uh, along with uh, Friar Antonio and uh, the sisters over there. So I say all of that 
Unfortunately, I believe the ordination is still by invitation only, but that may not be true. I don't know. Um, you certainly can show up tomorrow at 10 o'clock at St. Joseph Cathedral, and somebody may tell you, I'm sorry, you don't have a seat. I, that I don't know. I'm telling you this because I am probably not going to be back for noon for confessions. So if you intended to come to confession this weekend, know that you might want to come more towards one than towards noon. I'll be here as soon as I can, but it's not going to be, it, it probably won't be right at noon. Okay. So there's there's an ordination this weekend. I'm going to the ordination. The ordination has caused me to be delayed for our regular confessions. That was a long way to say confessions are going to start an hour later, but now you understand why. Okay. Last new piece of information is that the uh, Family Center renovation is actually going to begin uh, next week. Um, we, we had hoped... It would. It, we had weren't sure about exactly when it was going to begin. Now we know it's going to begin next week. But if you uh, if you look at the weekly update, I just realized before I got on here that there's no way it's beginning on Monday because uh, Monday is Memorial Day and we're going to be closed. So it'll probably start on Tuesday, uh, where we uh, the family center will be out of commission for a month. But it'll be it'll be brand new and and, and beautiful again in uh, the beginning of July. Okay, that is all I have from the weekly update, as disorganized as that may have been. I am going to switch to the preparing for the readings, and then I want to talk about the topic of the whole Sunday. So this is the reading you'll hear uh, at the... Uh, at, uh, this is the reading that you will hear as the second reading in Mass this Sunday. Brothers and sisters, for those who were led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption through whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If only we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Now let's go back. St. Paul says, this is St. Paul's letter to the Romans. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into. Now, that leads us to two things. The first is that the enemy, the enemy, wishes us to believe that we do have a spirit of slavery. That we are enslaved, whether to him or to our passions, whether to um, others in our lives, we, we, and it's always going to be this way. Whereas those of us who are baptized, even if there was a slavery, that can now be broken. At least in God, in, in, in things of eternity where it matters, that slavery is broken because we now have hope. We have the chance of redemption. If Jesus Christ had not did what he did on Holy in Holy Week all those many years ago, we would have no recourse. We, we could ask for forgiveness, but it couldn't it wouldn't do anything. But because Jesus did what he did all those many years ago during his earthly ministry, all the way up until the time he went back into heaven and sent the Holy Spirit down upon us, we now have the option of redemption. We can ask for the forgiveness of our sins. And as long as we repent, we're no longer slaves. And in baptism, we are given a spirit of adoption. Now, I know I've talked about this a, a number of times. But in that spirit of adoption, we no longer need to be enslaved. We are offered the opportunity of freedom. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road on this. You do not need to be a slave to your sin. Not that we can make that happen not that you can break free now, but that God is on your side. And if you were trapped in something, God is now is, is going to be able to help you as long as you ask him to. As long as you live the life of repentance. And St. Paul, as we go on a little farther, is going to talk about what are the conditions that allow for the kinds of freedom that Jesus Christ is talking about. We're adopted into God's family. That makes us heirs for whatever God owns, which is God uh, at the same time possesses nothing except himself, and in possessing himself, possesses everything. So God is our inheritance. 
again, if heaven is not the reward for this life lived well, and heaven, uh, hell is not the punishment of this life lived poorly, but instead uh, eternal life with God, if heaven is eternal life with God, our reward for the life lived well is God. And if we desire God, we will receive that reward. If it if we truly desire it. Now, our desire has to be connected to reality to be tr authentic desire. Um, so, you can, so if we have the authentic desire, we'll be transformed by that. And uh, we, we, God will bring us to himself. And we've been made heirs also in Jesus Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. So whatever is Jesus' reward, whatever Jesus inherits, we inherit. Now, we'll, we'll get into this a little later when we start talking about uh, Trinity itself, but the gift that God has given to Jesus, the, the gift that God the Father gives to God the Son, is the Holy Spirit. So, what does Jesus have? Well, he has the Holy Spirit and all that God has given to him, which is us. So, if we inherit what Jesus also inherits, what we inherit is the very life of God. It's the same idea but now it's from two different directions. Now, here's, here's the challenging part. St. Paul finishes with, if only we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Now, I encourage you not to see this as yet another experience of how there, there is a guilt associated with Catholicism. And if you don't live the guilt, you, you're not, you're not going to get to heaven. That is not the point of what St. Paul is time, trying to say. Although, you can certainly interpret that from what St. Paul has said. However, I encourage you to see it this way. If Jesus Christ is our elder brother, if Jesus Christ is the head leading us in the direction that we ought to go, if, if, if that's what the, the role that the Son has when he's incarnate in creation, why should we expect to do anything other than what the Son, our head and shepherd, who came before us, did? And if the way he gets to Easter and then to the resurrection, and to the ascension, is by way of his suffering, we should not expect anything other than to follow the footsteps of the Good Shepherd. We should not expect anything other than to follow in the footsteps of the teacher. And that means a willing acceptance of all the suffering that comes our way. Not necessarily that we go looking for suffering, not that suffering is a good thing, not that we desire suffering, but that when suffering comes my way, I don't run away from it. I don't run, I don't reject the suffering that Jesus Christ willingly accepted. And in this deepest, most mysterious way, the fathers of the church, the wisest and brightest of all of the Catholic theologians, find that it is a gift when the Lord sees fit for us to suffer. Now, that may be beyond all of us. It, it, certainly, sometimes it's beyond me. Uh, and beyond me, I, I don't mean I don't understand it, and I, that that bit does, like I forgot that suffering is good. No, in the moment, I just don't want to suffer. Like, I bang my foot. Uh, I, I get, that doesn't really happen, but like, for the sake of argument, like I'll bang my foot against the table, and like, I'm more concerned about the pain in my foot than the possibility that that suffering could be redemptive. I get distracted by the suffering that I'm enduring. And it's only when I slow down <clears throat> and often when the suffering is not like acute, like when it's not one of those immediate pains, like you cut your finger while you're, while you're cutting something like, yeah, uh, in that moment when the blood is pouring out of my thumb, I'm not particularly sold on the salvific quality of that suffering. But when it's wrapped up four hours later and I'm just trying to type on my computer or read a book or, or, you know, change a channel on the TV and it hurts. That's the time when we can reflect on the salvific quality of our suffering, join it to the sufferings of Jesus Christ and have it bear fruit in our lives, not just in eternity. Ultimately, of course, that is the goal is to bear fruit in eternity, but even to bear fruit now that now I can be one with Jesus Christ, at least in his suffering. And in my prayer, be union, unified, be in union with him now, even here on this earth. Now, this weekend, we are going to have all of the prayers at Mass are going to uh, reference, uh, and, and especially like the preface. If you've ever wondered that prayer, so uh, the priest will put the gifts on the altar, 
uh, usually quietly at Sunday mass while the music is playing. Um, and then um, he will uh, instruct all of us to pray. <clears throat> then he'll say a, a, one little prayer that's associated with that Sunday. And then he, he will say, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, lift up your hearts. Okay, that part, that's called the preface. If you pay attention, often the preface prayer on these big feasts is the most richly theological piece of the whole of the liturgy. If you want to understand in the most succinct way possible the mystery of, say, Christmas, listen to the Christmas prefaces. If you want to catch the most theologically dense version, the, a great summary of the whole mystery of the Trinity, pay attention to that preface. Okay, so this weekend, all of our prayers are going to focus on the dogma of the Trinity. Now, Trinity in Catholicism is not unre uh, unre onion, celery, and bell pepper. That's a Cajun joke. Trinity, in, in, in theological terms, refers to the idea that God, as he is in himself, is best described as a communion of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We reference this Every time we make the sign of the cross, it's referenced in a lot of our prayers. Pay attention to the opening prayer of Mass. The prayer is often addressed to the Father through the Spirit in uh, in in through the Son in the Spirit. All three persons are are present in that prayer. Obviously, we, we all, every time we make the sign of the cross, and this teaching is a matter of the faith. It, it goes all the way back to Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, the Christ, our Lord, reveals to us that God in himself, in, in addition to all the other names that God had been called, he who is the Lord, the, the, the Savior, is also, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is a new name for God because it reveals to us what God is in himself. This is this would be akin to, you know, two people are dating and some and, and one of them, like the guy tells the girl, some deep secret's probably not the right word I want to use, but like some deep thing, desire, hope for his life that he's kind of embarrassed to tell anybody else just because it's so personal that he feels like he'll be made fun of. But he shares it with his beloved so that she, whom he trusts, and knows, can know this deep part of his heart. So Jesus shares that with us, the way a lover would share some secret with their beloved. And it also makes sense of some of the most, for me, dense, difficult pieces of sacred scripture. Pay attention. These things drive me nuts, because sometimes I read the words of Jesus Christ, and I have no clue what he's talking about. Think about all the times that Jesus talks about Father, no one has known the Father except the Son, and no one knows the Son except the one whom, is cho whom he's chosen to reveal him to. We would not have known, we could not know, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit without the revelation of Jesus Christ. If he hadn't told us that, we wouldn't know. So this thing, this dogma, goes all the way back to Jesus. And the result, like if you picked up a book of theology or you pick up the, uh, the catechism and you look up this section on Trinity, all of that is to try and make sense of Jesus kind of said, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and left it. That there's no, not a whole lot of explanation as to what that means. And it caused crisis in the early church because... The first Christians were Orthodox, Jewish, monotheists. And Jesus, the Messiah of the Jewish faith, never denies that there is one God. But he also reveals that there's three persons in the one God. That there is this mystery of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the way that the church, as a collective of people, the way the church as people who seeking wisdom have chewed on this throughout the ages, has resulted in this dogma. Now I'm going to explain what that means all in a little bit. 
But we maintain, even to this day, there is one God. There's one God. And in fact, when God acts in creation, and when we speak to the Lord, St. Thomas makes this clear, when we speak to the Lord, we speak to the one God. Even if we say, dear Jesus, da 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 and finish our prayer addressing the Son, even the, the Christ, that whole prayer is addressed to the whole Trinity. Because there's one God, and when God acts in creation, when God acts in creation, we only experience him as the one God. But we know that God in himself is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, there really are three persons in God, but they're not so distinct as to create three gods. Instead, each person proceeds out of the Father. So, we say that the Father begets the Son. That's, that is the relationship a Father to Son is, is begetting. Uh, that's not a, a theologically dense argument. That's just the nature of our language and the way we communicate ideas. That a, the relationship between a Father and the Son is that the Father is that the Father begets the Son and the Son is begotten by the begotten by the Father. The part that is theologically dense is that the Holy Spirit is not begotten by the Father because there would be no difference between the Son and the Holy Spirit. Instead, the Holy Spirit is breathed by the Father. Or, theologically, spirated, which is a fancy word for breathe. Why is breathed used here so much? We're numb and desensitized to what the word spirit means. But in ancient Judaism, spirit and breath are the same word. The, the, not the same word. The same word is used for those two concepts. So, the, 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 this is why... When, when the breath of life is breathed into Adam, Adam is given a spirit. He's literally given a breath. But it's not the same as the breath that we breathe. It is something altogether different because the breath that we breathe does not actually animate us. You know, you can hold your breath and you don't, well, I mean, you don't immediately cease. You hold it long enough and I guess you will cease. And, you know, as painful as it may be, you can collapse a lung and you don't, at least immediately die. The breath that we breathe is not the same as the spirit that is within us that animates us. So, St. Augustine provides several really good ways to explain the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The image that he uses that's most, uh, most commonly used is the one of love. In a love relationship, just like I've already said, there is a lover... There is a beloved, the one whom the lover loves. And then there is the relationship between them. There is the love that is exchanged and shared. Now, who is the greatest person that God can love with the greatest intensity? And who can receive all of God's love with the greatest intensity? Well, the only person that can do that is God. So, without being prideful, God loves himself. And the love with which he loves himself, the, 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 God loves himself, and that expression of love, analogously, is the Son. And the love shared between the two is the Holy Spirit. St. Paul has this powerful line where he talks about Jesus is the image, the Son is the image of the Father. Imagine if you looked in a mirror imagine a perfectly healed and healthy world. You looked in a mirror and you saw yourself and you could express deep love for yourself. The, the love that you would have for yourself images and reflects the Holy Spirit. Now, this was a long way to say all of these things, that in God, there is a communion of persons. Now, remember, you and I are made in the image and likeness of God. So, if at the very least what we learn from the dogma of the Trinity is more about ourselves, because most of the, the, the theology of the Trinity is like good to know and maybe can purify some misconceptions in our own minds, but it's not really anything you can act on. 
practically. However, we can learn a lot about ourselves from this great mystery. So, if we're made in the image and likeness of God, and God is in himself a communion of persons, we learn that you and I are made for relationship. You and I are made to love. St. John says that God is love. It's not in love's nature to do nothing. Love is diffusive of itself. Love acts. Love wants to love someone. And of course, this is why there's a communion of persons at the core of God. But you and I are made for love. And we, unlike God, God is complete in himself. You and I are not necessarily incomplete, but like we don't make sense as social beings separated from everybody else. Me alone on an island, uh, in addition to going crazy and not, but me personally not knowing what to do to survive on a desert island, I don't make sense on my own. And I need another person, or at least not make sense is maybe not even the right word. I will not reach full human flourishing on a desert island by myself because I have nobody to give myself to. St. John Paul II often talked about man only truly understands himself when he makes a sincere gift of himself. You and I don't make sense on our own, and we will not flourish unless we can be a gift to somebody else. In all of this, we image the Trinity in. So, not only in our families, do as a, as a small domestic communion of persons, every relationship, if it is an authentic relationship, reflects the very indwelling of God because there is a lover and a beloved and the love shared in between. And love is, this is constitutive of love. So if you don't have this, it's not really love. Of course, love perdures even when you don't have a, uh, something going on. But like, I love only exists when I give of myself to another person. Like that actual action of me making some sacrifice for another person is love. And when they receive it, it's reciprocated back to myself, and it completes sort of a cycle or a loop. Um, the son loves the father, too. But the son loves the father with the love that the father has given to him. So it's a reciprocal relationship. Every relationship images the Trinity. It, it, obviously, um, if, if a wife only loved her husband and, she didn't, and he didn't love her back, this is a broken relationship. Um, and in fact, it's, a, it's a, it, terrible to say, but this is very common. And it, it, can, it goes both ways. But when the, when the relationship is healthy, there is a reciprocal giving and receiving, giving and receiving. Both people give, both people receive. Generally not at the same time, but um, it, it can be. And sometimes they manage to, in the reciprocal process, amplify the love. Think about receiving a gift it's a little bit embarrassing you you, you really kind of like it um but it but it feels awkward now remember what it's like to give a gift especially one that the other person received well and loved it's not this one and done thing instead i really give something to this other person and they receive it and when they receive it with joy i receive back their joy and, and the, the reciprocity between the two becomes this powerful thing. So this weekend, we're, we're given to chew on the mystery of the, of the Trinity as God uh, is in himself, which teaches us about who we are. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O most holy Trinity, we offer you today all of our many desires and wants. Help us to fall more deeply in love with you. Please guide our church, particularly here at Christ the Redeemer, that we fall ever more in love with you. Please guide our nation. Help us to become more unified. Protect us from the coronavirus. Protect us from this upcoming hurricane season. Please send us an increase of vocations to the priesthood, to the consecrated life, and for more holy marriages. Finally, Lord, we offer up to you all those who are ill today, all those who will go without today, and all those who will die. 
the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, y'all. Peace. Y'all have a nice evening.